Yeah, thank you, man. When I was on the uh, Los Angeles Police Department, we got a radio call of a five-year-old girl at a daycare who said it hurt when she peed. So uh, my partner um, was five foot nine, 245 pounds of bodybuilder. His arms were bigger than me. So give you an idea, because that'll come into the story in a minute. And um, so we got to the daycare and we saw the teacher there and they said, well, we just got her back from uh, medical treatment and um, she uh, has gonorrhea. Now, how does a five-year-old girl get gonorrhea? So um, I had to sit down with the little girl and ask her what had happened to her. And what she described to me was that she was raped every night by her father, her uncle, and her father's best friend. And uh, I tell you, you haven't lived until you have to have a five-year-old girl describe to you in detail uh, that. So um, after that, what happens is you, they were divorced, the mom and dad. So <clears throat> we were down in the, in the ghetto in South Central Los Angeles. You guys would probably know as Compton. So we had to go, we take the girl back to her mom and that would be the end of it. And then we would write her up a report and leave it with the child uh, abuse detectives to take care of. Except where as we were leaving, the mother said, I'm worried about my son. Why? Well, he's two and he's with the father right now. So father lived about a mile away. And so we <clears throat> drove over to where the, the father lived. It was about one o'clock in the morning or so. And I was single, I didn't have any kids. And all of you guys know who have kids, how much you change towards children when you have your own kids, right? You understand the love of a child. But when you're 22, like I was, you don't really know. But my partner was married and he had a five-year-old daughter. And she looked a lot like the girl that we had just left. So I didn't realize that my partner was starting to go a little crazy on our way over. So we went over to a <clears throat> slum apartment, walked up the steps and kicked the door down. And as I kicked the door down, the dad jumped out of the bed naked and the little boy was naked. So I <clears throat> stepped across the, the apartment to give him a thorough beating. This was before cameras. <laughs> and um, as I grabbed him with one hand, I grabbed him by the throat and I went to hit him with my right hand. My partner's giant forearm came along and just brushed me back and his nine millimeter, he was left-handed, came up against the guy and he started to pull the trigger. And I remember seeing, you know, in those moments of trauma, of where things are slow. I remember seeing out of the corner of my eye the little kid standing on the bed just watching. And I remember thinking that kid does not need to see his father get executed by two cops. And so we were trained, most people know this, but a third of policemen are shot with their own guns. Do you guys know that? A third of policemen are shot with their own guns. We were trained to not get shot with their own guns. You, you put your finger behind the trigger so that someone can't engage the trigger. So I threw my left hand behind the trigger of his, of James' gun, so he couldn't pull the trigger. And then we got in a fight. So James and I hit the ground rolling around for about 30 seconds fighting over that gun. And I'm telling you, I didn't want to lose that fight. And uh, I don't think that the pervert had ever rooted for anybody in a fight like he rooted for me <laughs> at that moment. But um, after about 30 seconds, thank the Lord, I heard what in the heck is going on. And we looked up and our lieutenant was standing in the doorway. Now, lieutenants don't leave the police station. So he had just decided to come out and see how his men were doing. Not well. Um, but it, it, stunned, it stunned my partner and I was able to get his gun away from him and throw it over to the lieutenant. And my partner never spoke to me again after that night. He, you know, he said, you know, you should have let me execute that guy. He doesn't deserve to live. And I said, his son doesn't deserve to see his father executed by cops. Now, what am I talking about now? What, what's the point of all this? There are times in life when we find out who we are. Times of great trauma, right? Now, my identity at that moment was not a Los Angeles policeman. My identity was a son of God. Does that make sense? <clears throat> I mean, people have a different reaction to hold that whole story. I mean, what was right, what was wrong. But um, when, a, when a moment of testing came, who I was, my character came out of me in a way that was in a real life situation. See, I think many of us have a wrong idea of who we are. What's your identity? Are you a 
former college football player? Are you a Harvard graduate? Are you a wealthy guy? Are you white? Are you black? See, our identity needs to be that we're sons of Jesus Christ. We're sons of the Most High God. I think today, we, a lot of us have this idea that we're bad people, but Jesus loves us anyway. Right? I mean, do you, you know what I'm, I'm saying? A lot of us think, I'm bad, but Jesus loves me anyway, so I'm going to try not to be bad, but it's okay, because if I am bad, he still loves me. And what happens is you get into a cycle of trying not to be bad, but knowing you really can't help it because you're a bad person, because your identity comes and I'm a bad person. Your identity is that you were bad. If you've placed your faith in Jesus, you have been transformed into a new creature. You are a son of God. Amen. And when you're a son of God, what does that make you? It makes you a prince. Now, how do princes act? So I think so many of us are trying to be good men. That's one of the problems I had when I took over promise keepers. Well, who's the promise keeper? God's the promise keeper. We're just doing the best that we can, right? So if Jesus gave the entire salvation message in John 3, 16, which he did, if you believe, you're saved. That's the only thing it takes to be saved. Belief, I would say, based on all the scripture that leads to repentance, is salvation. Then if that's the case, what are all the rest of his words about? What's, what's the Sermon on the Mount about, really? So let's take Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you're saved through faith. Most of you guys can quote this with me. For by grace you're saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not from works, so that no one should boast. Every one of us is a sinner saved by the grace of God, and we did nothing. Even the faith that we have to believe in him is a gift from God, right? We all agree with that? What's the next verse? Ephesians 2, 10. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works, which were prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Every one of us was saved, who is saved. God had a plan for our lives from the beginning of time for us to accomplish. See, the problem with a lot of men is we don't think we have a purpose in life. We swallowed this lie that we're bad people, but Jesus loves us anyway. When in fact, at the beginning of time, God had you in mind to accomplish good works in his name. But more so than that, you know, I'm a big justice guy, obviously, as a, as a former policeman. We have this unjust j j idea of God that somehow, if we're all, when we all die, we're all just gonna go to the same heaven. We're all just gonna be in the same place and it's all gonna be the same way. That's not what Jesus teaches. Do you know what the last words of the Bible are? The very last words of Revelation chapter 22, Jesus starts off a speech to end scripture. Behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to each person according to what he has, he has done. Oh, we weren't saved by good works, but we were saved for good works. And Jesus has rewards for us to give to us. Second Corinthians 5.10, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God to be rewarded for what we've done, whether good or worthless. So all of Jesus's words then are not about salvation. They're about how to be holy, how to be holy. So we have the Beatitudes, you have the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus has given in Matthew 5 a, a series of things. This is what holiness looks like. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The beginning of holiness is when you realize, I bring nothing to the, to the table of Christianity except for the sin that nailed Jesus to the cross. That's it. That's the beginning of holiness. And we keep going. And you know what the end is? Do you know what the idea that we've reached holiness is? Blessed are you when people persecute you and say all kinds of evil things against you. Rejoice. Great is your reward in heaven. Congratulations, you're holy. Everybody hates you. <laughs> right? And I can just tell you, there's something about walking with Christ with brothers. You'll have the best friends you've ever had, and they'll be a really small group, and the rest of the world is going to hate you. So I ask you guys here, you, you want to know, how am I walking with Christ? How's my walk with Christ? Well, how many enemies do you have? Who hates you? You know, people say... You can judge a man by his friends. I, I say, no, nah, I think you can judge a man by his enemies. Who hates you and why? I had, I had uh, massive death threats. I got a, there was an article about me in USA Today um, last summer, and I mean, it was brutal. It would, uh, we were getting all these death threats and everything else, and my wife said, geez, Ken, aren't you kind of worried? And I said, baby, the people writing these death threats are Navy SEALs. I mean, this is some guy in his underwear screaming at his mom for his meatloaf. You know, so. <laughs> I 
We all saw the movie, man. I wish I could do the quote, but it just doesn't work without the F word. Um, so uh, there's the answer, though. I, I, you know, I got thrown out of a Christian high school, and then I followed that up by getting thrown out of a Christian college. And because um, I couldn't stop asking why. Why? I mean, Jesus says, give up all. He says, if you're not willing to give up all your possessions, you're not worthy of me. He said, I came to set the world on fire and how I wish it was already alight. Well, why? Pick up your cross daily and follow me. Well, I thought salvation was grace alone. It is. Well, then why should I, why should I be a good guy? Why should I give up my whole life? Why should I have a daring faith in a cowardly world? Because you're going to be judged with what you did with your salvation. That's why. Because God has a mission for you to accomplish. And if you don't accomplish it, it doesn't get done. Because we never thought we would see the day. Let me just imagine we're all men here. Puberty was a good thing for all of us. All right, we got hair all over our body. Our voices got deeper. We got stronger. We were men. Imagine puberty for a woman. Imagine. Right? All of a sudden, you start having a menstrual cycle. The guys that you used to catch frogs with and play basketball with are all of a sudden way better than you, and they're all looking at you weird now. Do you think that's traumatic? Now, imagine a t teacher coming along and saying, well, the reason you're uncomfortable is because you're really a boy. Let's cut your breasts off. Do we ever think we'd get here? What was un unthinkable 10 years ago is unquestionable today. Why? Because the men aren't standing up. Why aren't the men standing up? Because they're afraid. What are you afraid of? Of people saying mean things about me. Jesus said, rejoice, great is your reward in heaven. When people are saying mean things about you, congratulations, you made it. As long as you're saying, they're saying it because you're not a jerk, but when you're filled with love, right? Let's, let's always remember that part. Of it. You don't get to, to, to go to, to the end by being obnoxious. You've got to go through the whole loving thing, right? <laughs> I want to say one last thing, because I have a, a thing I always want to leave more time than I, than I had allotted for me. We have an enemy, and I don't think we preach on it nearly enough. The devil is there. Who is he? The great liar. What does he do? Every one of us went through points in life where a wrong identity was put on us. Every one of us, right? Your dad said mean things to you. The coach didn't play you. Uh, something traumatic happened. Some, I was, I've been shocked at, at, at Promise Keepers at about how many men have faced sexual trauma when they were boys, right? So some, some kind of identity, some kind of trauma, all of us have had that. The time that your wife said something that just broke your heart. Satan will bring those things back to reiterate that wrong identity to you over and over and over. Right? Boom, boom, boom. People will say something to you and it hurts it, and they didn't even know it hurt because they didn't know what it was. He'll constantly bring things in to, that will reiterate whatever wrong idea you have. That's why Jesus said you have to pick up your cross daily and follow me. You've got to remember every morning, I'm a new creature in Christ. I'm not that person. And when you want to get, start following that calling he has for you, Satan is going to come along and say, remember what you did? Remember what you said? If somebody asked me one time, if you could go back and live life over again, knowing all you know now, what would you do? I mean, would you, would you try harder to make it to the NFL? Would you, you know, blah, 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 blah. I said, you know what I'd do? I would go back and unhurt all the people I hurt. You know what I mean? All the things I said to my wife when I was too stupid to know any better, Right? I have found um, the most powerful words as a father that, that, that there are are, I'm sorry. Son, I, I didn't mean to. Daughter, I'll tell you guys, um, every daughter wants her dad to be her protector. She wants to know her dad would do whatever it takes. And every son wants his dad to be his hero. And it never changes. And I don't care how much they hate you. I don't care if you had a bad divorce. They still want that. And I'm sorry is remarkably powerful. When my son-in-law, who he was a starting defensive tackle for Liberty, came to ask me to, to marry my daughter, I said, well, um, you understand when you marry into a family, you, uh, you marry a girl, you marry the whole family, right? Whether you like it or not. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, this kid's, you know, 6'3", 290. I'm walking along with him in a snowstorm. And, and uh, I said, well, I want to let you know that if you have any weird hang-ups, 
If you got any perversity things going on, anything like that, this is the time to not marry my daughter because it, you marry the whole family. And I want to let you know that if you marry my daughter and you ever hurt her like that, I'll kill you. And he started laughing. I go, I'm not kidding. <laughs> he has been the greatest son in the world. He is a son to us. But I said to him, I'm my daughter's father. I'm not your buddy. You know, girls need that. They need that. Boys need a hero. Are you that to your, your family? Because that's part of your calling. So when, as I close right now, I just want to say this. Part, a lot of times we take a talk like this and we think that means I have to do a great thing. I have to be the big man. Let me tell you, the guy on the stage is not the big man. The guy who writes books, the pastor, the, we think that in the church. God has a thing for you to accomplish and he gave you the gifts for you to accomplish it. The, one of the greatest things you can do is raise godly kids. God says in Malachi chapter 3, I hate divorce. Why does he hate divorce? I want godly offspring. Be a great businessman. Be a great carpenter, a great plumber. Be what God has put you to be in your place. And if you can do something more than that, I'll tell you what, if you can get involved on your school board, start asking what you're teaching my kids, right? If you can start just asking your kids, what did you learn in school today? What? You learned what? Let's go have a talk, conversation with the teacher. I'll tell you what, these teachers would be saying a lot less of this crap if they actually had strong men coming in there and saying enough of that, right? This is, I just want to encourage you today that what you do in this life matters. I don't think we hear that enough of the church. That's what I wrote that book, A Daring Faith, about is, man, have some stones, and if you have some stones, God's going to reward you. When you look at Scripture, it's a filled with stories of screwed up people who did amazing things. Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith. Basically, it's the most screwed up list of people that, that you've ever seen. And then God says, be like them. You're like, really? Because what did they do? They were people of action who took a stand. Father, I just pray for these men this morning. We have so many lies around. It seems like this whole explosion of, of social media and the internet has just given Satan every lie in the world swirling around us and it's so hard for us to hear the truth. I pray that we remember that your word is the truth. That nothing that is against your word is true. That your word is the truth. And that those of us who've lived 50 years or 80 years have lived a tiny little vapor. You said we're like a blade of grass that rises up in the morning and scorches the noonday sun. We know nothing. We know nothing apart from you. And I pray, Lord, that you said in the parable of the, the sower that sometimes truth comes and it hits us and we grasp it but Satan comes along and snatches it away and I pray Father that for these men here this morning that this truth would not get snatched away I pray that they remember who they are that they are sons of God and as they struggle with sin struggle with pornography struggle with being verbally abusive a bad temper financial problems Father I pray that they wouldn't try to be better they would remember who they are we just love you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the ability to come before the throne in confidence in your name. In Jesus, Jesus' name, amen. I want to say one last thing to you. There's a great quote in, in uh, World War II when the, Jew, when the uh, Germans started realizing the Jews were being so terribly abused. See, I, I'm going to leave a minute 30. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. um, when they realized the Jews were being so terribly abused, so some Christian leaders went to one of the great leaders they respected and they said what do we do about the problem of the Jews and the Christian leader said I can't tell you what to do about the Jews but I can tell you who you are and if you know who you are you'll know what to do and you remember that quote